Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Ling, and welcome back to a new season of The Road to a Vaccine. This series is an exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. When we first started the show, we wondered if we'd have enough to talk about for eight weeks. But as the pandemic has grown, it seems there's a lot of discussion and accurate reporting needed now more than ever. So we will continue this conversation throughout the remainder of the year. It's been over a month since our last broadcast and COVID continues to spread across the globe. Let's take a look at where we are today. Johns Hopkins reports 11.5 million cases and nearly 540,000 deaths globally, with the U.S. and Brazil leading the way in confirmed new cases over the last month. According to the WHO, there are 17 vaccine candidates in the clinical evaluation stage. We are continuing to see disproportionate effects of COVID in poor communities and communities of color. And the CDC added three new symptoms to the list, reminding us that public health information on the disease remains a moving target. Now, as the global community searches for answers in the quest for a successful COVID-19 vaccine, there is much we can learn from other diseases that have come before, specifically HIV. We decided to come back live today because it's the 23rd International AIDS 2020 Conference. So we wanna discuss the ongoing battle with HIV and the effort to develop a vaccine and how that battle can inform this new crisis. Now we know HIV AIDS has been one of the world's most fatal infectious diseases over the last several decades. The human suffering and social and political unrest that has come along with it have impacted generations. But the pain of the pandemic has also given rise to incredible hope in the actions of advocates and activists who have rallied to find a cure. Antiviral treatments have enabled many patients to live full lives, but still almost a million people die from HIV AIDS every year globally. The road to a vaccine continues. We have an incredible lineup of guests today. I am so excited to have Laverne Cox. You know her from Orange is the New Black, and she is an award-winning actress and HIV AIDS activist. And she'll be talking about the stigma as a trans woman during the time of AIDS and parallels between COVID and the AIDS pandemic. We also have Makaya uh, Doogie. Makaya Daogi, uh, Head of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs at Janssen Vaccines. And she'll be answering questions that so many of you are asking, like how clinical trials are being set up and why she has to chase the virus. Now, throughout the show, if you have questions, please put them in the comment section. We'll be answering uh, as many as we can throughout the show. First up, though, I want to welcome back Dr. Paul Stoffels, J&J's Chief Scientific Officer. and He's the world's leading expert in innovation in HIV vaccine development and has spent the last 30 years fighting HIV. Now he's the leading J &J op uh, he's leading J&J's efforts to develop a COVID vaccine. Dr. Paul Stoffels, it's been a couple of weeks. How are you doing? Good, Lisa. Good to see you again. Well, well, first, I want to congratulate you on the new announcement. I understand the recruitment for HIV trials has been completed and 2,600 patients have been enrolled. That is a, a, a pretty significant milestone, isn't it? That's a significant milestone, yeah. We started a long time ago on working on this vaccine and now the first study is fully recruited as well as fully vaccinated. So all the women who are in the study have, been, have got their entire vaccination scheme. So uh, that's a big achievement. Well, I, I want to talk to you about your lifelong fight to battle the AIDS virus. But first, it has been a few weeks since we last talked, and I have to ask, what uh, are the latest developments with the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, I think uh, we're learning every day, and we are moving very fast. We have been able to accelerate the start of clinical trials to mid-July. We have done extensive animal testing in the meantime, uh, published two big papers, uh, which shows an animal model as well as the vaccination principles and more to follow. And we learned that we can get to very good protection. And that is, uh, that's now led to an acceleration of the clinical trial start to mid-July. And hopefully by the end of September, we will be ready for efficacy studies. So good progress and still uh, everything solid on track. Mm -hmm. Certainly, and we will look forward to talking to you more about that in the coming weeks. Now, you've been fighting AIDS since its early days in Africa. I read that you had a close friend in Africa who became infected in the 80s, and you worked your whole life to try and save him, and you did. What was that like uh, as a friend and a scientist? 
Well, it was uh, a big motivation uh, to, to go fast and to do very good research to see whether we can uh, get a treatment for HIV. And it was in the early days, back in the late 80s, early 90s, that uh, the first cases came with significant drug resistance. And we learned that for HIV, resistance became the critical the critical factor to solve it. And he was the first patient ever, I think, which was tested for resistance in a laboratory. And out of that came a lot of information for us to move forward. So we have been working on the HIV virus um, and it helped us a lot to understand how to do virology, uh, getting to biomarkers, accelerated clinical development, accelerated drug development with the regulators in the world, and so also to accelerate access for patients. And we learned to work fast because we were saving lives. And I think in COVID now, we do exactly the same. We have to work extremely fast to save lives, but the environment is there now, which we can build on, on what we learned over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, there is no vaccine for HIV, but prevention methods like PrEP, pre-exposure prophylactics, and other therapeutics have really come a long way. So what is the current status of, <clears throat> excuse me, the HIV vaccine uh, development? And if these other treatments have been so successful, um, is, is a vaccine really imperative? Yeah, the, the challenge with the HIV virus is that it's an enormous mutable virus. Yeah? So if you have billions of viruses in your body, almost none are the same. You have like a swarm of viruses, uh, which are all somewhat different. And that's why treatment and vaccination is very difficult. So we had to work 30 years on get to simple one pill once a day and now one injection every month or even one injection every second month will be possible. But it was so difficult to overcome that, that mutation pattern of HIV virus is that we had to work very hard to get it under control. Second, um, we also learned on potency. Uh, when we started our clinical trials, now back in the early 90s, we were treating patients with two times 18 tablets a day. So a handful of tablets in the morning, a handful of tablets in the evening. And so with, uh, with years long of research, we were able to optimize potency as well as the spectrum. So how many viruses we can tackle, different types of viruses we can tackle with one medicine. And we were able over 20 years to go from those 18 pills twice a day to one pill once a day, now to one injection every second month. And that, that evolution, uh, brought, I think, longevity to many people living with HIV and can live now full lives because if you start early enough and you take your medication, you can live a life long even without anybody knowing. You have to take your medicines every day. A vaccine, because the virus is such a mutation, is such prone mutations to many mutations, it has always been extremely difficult for uh, getting to a vaccine. The, the virus makes the person sick because of its mutations. The, vi the, the body has to fight continuously new viruses. And that's the pat pathology behind the HIV vaccine, uh, the HIV virus. And therefore, vaccine was difficult. So we had to work for many, many years to find fundamental ways to tackle um, the HIV virus with, uh, with, with different and very broad spectrum and different types of antibodies to be able to make a vaccine. And that was, um, and that, that yielded over the last few years good results. And now we are testing it in a very large scale study in Southern Africa and also a second one in the Americas. And so we made a lot of progress. We have good hope, but uh, still uh, some time to go. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, the, the, that virus is a very fast mutating one. Now, j and has been working to end HIV for decades. So what have you learned in the past 30 years from that quest uh, to develop an HIV vaccine that you are now applying to accelerate the development of a COVID-19 vaccine? Yeah, we learned a lot. Um, we learned basically that we first have to go do good fundamental research and very quickly to understand the virus very well. And in COVID, we put a whole group of people, more than 100 people jointly from uh, from the Harvard School from and with Dan Baruch and ourselves on that. We created several different vaccines uh, prototypes in order to learn which one would be have the best um, the, the best immunogenicity, and we selected one which the best outcome, and then now the best animal outcome. So we learned to work fast. We learned we learned all types of techniques we can use fast in in evaluation. 
and uh, that has helped most. Also, what, what we learned from HIV is working with the regulators. So very early on, sharing the information with those who in the end have to approve your vaccine or have to approve your medicine. And we try to have an interface which can make us going very fast. And that's why we now, within six months from having a new virus to starting clinical trials, we can do it in six months. Basically all based on 30 years of research in virology and mainly in HIV. So we use all the tools and all the collaborative effort in the world to make this happen now. It is incredible how you can employ that kind of synergy. Dr. Sofels, I have a question uh, from Ashish from LinkedIn who asks, uh, is J&J &J in COVID vaccine development and what major challenges are you experiencing in development? Any challenges? Well, the challenge is going to be, the main challenge will now be studying the vaccine real life uh, for efficacy. So we are, we need to go to areas where there is a lot of transmission to do a controlled study where we can measure placebo and active and see, can we show in a very short time that, that, that it works? And therefore it's very unstable where we have to go. So we have to organize a whole group of people who are the epidemic ch chasers. We have to go after it in order to be able to do the vaccines in the right place, but also in the right countries. And that's probably going to be the, ma the main challenge now. While we have a vaccine, which which is built on a platform we know very well, we can produce it. We have good animal models. Now phase one, of course, we have to show that we have the similar activity there. But I see before now and a vaccine availability is going to be doing the clinical trial to show that it works. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking to Makaya De Oji a little bit later uh, on the sh in the show about the clinical trials. Uh, I have to, Dr. Soffels, ask you about the role of, of government and, and collaboration with governments. How does political will play a role in managing pandemics like COVID? And why is it crucial now in the midst of this public health crisis? And, and what happens when there's inconsistency in a government's response to a pandemic? Well, there are two, two pieces to this. On the one hand, it's re response and try to prevent. That's a whole different science, art and organization to diagnose, to make sure people isolate, to have social distancing and all of that implemented. Different countries do that in different ways. And you see that the result is like it could be uh, uh, good to very bad if you if you don't get it under control. Now in Europe, we see in many places where it was under control, we see the resurgence after, after uh, the fact that uh, the regulations were released. So that's one part of the action. The other part is going after the signs and the, co the collaboration with the governments to get to fundamental solutions. And there we can make new medicines, uh, both antibodies and, and medicines, antivirals, also new treatments to make those who are sick, we can help better through their period when they are sick, but then also the vaccines. And there we have seen an unprecedented collaboration between academic networks, but also NIH and, and industry, uh, between the regulators, but also co-funding on a global basis all those efforts. This is an unprecedented pandemic, which needs unprecedented measures to find the prevention and the treatments for, uh, for COVID-19. And that's where we are mainly focused on, and we see like an incredible collaboration going. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stoffels, I have one more question from Chandra. She is uh, from the AIDS conference and she's asking, uh, is there any progress in the sector of HIV vaccine development? Uh, I think we've been talking about that and how uh, is it possible and for how long will it take to actually get it to market? Well, the, we have two studies ongoing. Um, one is in, 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 it's our not patients, it's our young women in Southern Africa who are the highest risk people in the world. They live in di difficult conditions and we are there doing the evaluation whether the vaccine work in women. And then we have a second study where it's North and South America and a few countries in Europe where we test the vaccine in MSM and in transgenders. And so those two studies are the basis of, of our program. Um, we had very strong animal data before we started these studies, and we have good hopes that we will pick up an efficacy signal, that we see efficacy, but so far it never happened in a way that the vaccine was useful for HIV. Hopefully we can bring a big breakthrough. How long it will happen, it depends on, on still the, the second study started in the middle of the COVID, 
period and there we have some challenges to uh, we had to slow it down because in the COVID period it's very difficult to uh, to recruit people the, the the study in south africa as i said earlier fully recruited fully vaccinated now we'll uh, we'll see the result of that in the next 18 uh 18 to uh, 24 months so uh, that's what uh, what it takes um well, Dr. Stoffels, thank you so much for sharing the progress that you're making with the, the HIV vaccine as well as the COVID vaccine. And we'll look forward to talking to you in the coming weeks uh, about how things are going with the COVID vaccine. Thank you for joining us. As we face COVID-19, the HIV crisis has taught us resiliency, how important it is to always fight for life. And the HIV crisis has also taught us that pandemics disproportionately affect the black community. COVID-19 is not immune to this truth. Resources and funding need to go toward protecting black lives. Our lives matter. Always fight for life. Always fight for life. Now, in case you're just joining us, this is the Road to a Vaccine, an exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. We are live now from the annual AIDS 2020 conference, talking about what we can learn from the AIDS crisis that we can apply to the COVID pandemic today. Someone who has lived through both of these is our next guest. Laverne Cox is an actress and passionate advocate for the transgender community. She is working so hard to help end the stigma surrounding HIV AIDS that is so persistent in our world today. Laverne Cox, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, how are you? I'm doing well, uh, especially seeing you. I'm such a, a huge fan of yours. now. This is the second pandemic that you have experienced. First, uh, AIDS and now COVID. Although AIDS is bloodborne and COVID is airborne, are you seeing parallels between them? For sure. I, I'm reminded of the early days. I was, of course, very young when, um, when we discovered HIV. I think um, I'm 48 years old, so I think I was about 10 years old when I heard about um, AIDS for the first time. And back in the day, they called it, it was called GRID, and it was called a gay cancer. And, and then there was such a sense of uncertainty about transmission, and so there was such a level of fear. When I, when I see um, COVID patients in hospitals now and, and healthcare workers in hazmat suits, I think about the AIDS wards that existed back in the 1980s and so much of the sort of anxiety about transmission and the fear. And so I think that uncertainty is is, is very paralleled in, in this moment and, and, and the PTSD and the trauma for folks who have lived through both is so real. I've talked to other folks who are older than me who, who are experiencing a lot of trauma and this is a traumatizing experience collectively. We are collectively traumatized by a global pandemic all over again. And, and so having a trauma-based approach to our healing and ways in which we can address mental health, I think is crucial right now. Well, as an advocate, you've been so outspoken about the stigma surrounding HIV AIDS. Now, there's a growing undercurrent of stigma with COVID, although not to the same level, but people are afraid to divulge whether they've had it or been exposed to it. Attacks on people who are Asian have increased exponentially because the virus reputedly started in China. Are you noticing similarities in the way of stigma? And, and how does stigma affect one's mental health? And what can we do differently this time? We must learn the lessons of, from HIV and how we've stigmatized populations. I know so many people who are living with HIV AIDS who still on an interpersonal level experience so much stigma around their diagnosis and it's a diagnosis. It's, it's not a determinant for who you are as a person or your worth or worthiness. Um, and we still have um, a government that in 34 states still criminalizes HIV. In 2020, 34 states have laws on the books still that criminalize people. So when we have policies in place that lead to stigmatizing particular populations. And so we have to be very careful, right? In the early days of HIV AIDS, it was the LGBTQ plus community, mainly gay men who were deeply stigmatized by this. We cannot allow ourselves to stigmatize certain populations in this moment. And it's so, stigma is so insanely isolating. It, it, the sense of being unworthy of love, unworthy of connection is, 
it's it's so detrimental to our sense of well-being. And so we should not be doing that to each other. And we uh, and our government should definitely not be doing that. I think one other thing, too, that we should be reminded of is that one of the big reasons why um, HIV AIDS um, exploded in such a way in the early 1980s was the lack of a government response. The doctor was just so generous with um, the way he answered your question about what the, what our government is doing and, and what I'm seeing as a citizen is, is there's not there's not enough testing or tracing, and we um, found out last night from the CDC that black and brown people are three times more likely to contract the coronavirus. So there need I feel like there needs to be a more robust um, government response, um, particularly thinking about what um, the parallels between this moment and the um, HIV/AIDS moment in the 1980s. Yeah, I mean, it, it is still so astounding that COVID has become so politicized when so many people in, in America uh, have died, so many people around the world have died and cases are continuing to explode around the world. Um, does, that, does that surprise you how, how politicized COVID has become? <sighs> I think becoming politicized right now, nothing really surprises me. I think a lot of that it comes from the, the from the top, right? That in the, and our leadership has basically politicized this and made this um, about their reelection for for office in terms of our federal government. And there also, I think, is a level of incompetence around it. Oh, it's so. The divide and conquer, the us versus them, you're not with us or against us, is so very detrimental to us getting to a place of love. When the doctor earlier talked about his friend who um, he um, wanted to treat, I heard so much love in, in, in that, that, that love was the thing that kept him fighting to um, find medications and a cure for HIV AIDS, that love for his friend and love for people. And how do we restore that? Cornell West reminds us that justice is what love looks like in public. How do we love each other through this and, 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 and cut through all of this sort of political divisiveness? It is just, it doesn't serve us and it keeps us from each other. And it's, I mean, COVID-19 doesn't know if you're Republican or Democrat and doesn't care. And it's so, it's so very sad to see this happening in this way. It's such a good point. Laverne, you uh, are so passionate about trans inclusion in HIV research. Why is that so important to you? I mean, data is so crucially important. This is 2020, right? Hopefully everyone out there is filling out their census information. Data collection is so hugely important. And we, as trans folks, are very rarely counted, included in studies, included in data. We don't actually have um, a question about transgender folks, LGBTQ folks on our um, census. And data collection is so crucial in terms of ac um, accessing resources and in terms of research and development. And so it is amazing that trans folks are being included in these vaccine studies. Studies. And it's just crucial that we are included. And ultimately, it's the most marginalized folks who have to be included. We know that, unfortunately, um, transgender folks are five times more likely to be living with HIV AIDS um, in relationship to COVID-19. When you have what we do seem to know is that if you have an underlying medical condition, that means you're more likely to maybe um, contract corona and have um, unfortunate or um, health outcomes in relationship um, to COVID-19. And so anyone who is the most marginalized are the people we should be elevating and counting and making sure that they're included. Because they, if we can, if we can get to the people who are most marginalized, then we can, you know, really do something to uh, prevent Corona and then ultimately um, HIV AIDS, I think. Well, we, we've talked a lot on this show about racial and ethnic disparities with COVID and healthcare, and we know that uh, it's exacerbating discrimination in healthcare for trans people. What are your thoughts on this, and, and what are you seeing right now in the trans community, especially in communities of color? Well, again, we don't have wonderful data because we're not asking the questions in our data collection. But what we do know, again, is that um, trans folks, because of stigma, are less likely to seek out health care. We um, don't have um, access, the same kind of access to health care. So many of us have experienced trauma in health care, so we're less likely to seek, seek help. And so that is certainly going to affect 
our ability to be able to to fight this thing. Um, so I think again, it's about health access, access to healthcare for everyone, um, letting go of stigma. I think that's some work we can do for ourselves as trans folks. But then it's work that healthcare professionals need to be doing, that that our government should be doing as well, so that folks feel safe seeking out um, healthcare and knowing that they're not going to be stigmatized and they're not going to be misgendered when they go to the doctor, ask questions that are um, inappropriate to why they're there. These things are still happening to trans folks, unfortunately. So the data collection and then uh, addressing stigma in healthcare are still, I think, two big issues. Laverne, how, how pervasive is that, the, the, the mistreatment of trans people in, in healthcare? According to the latest U.S. trans survey, about, I think it's about 29, 30% of trans folks reported that they experienced some kind of discrimination in healthcare, either that was being denied hormones, denied treatment, being misgendered in some way. So um, that's, that's what we're seeing according to the latest data from the U.S. trans survey. Laverne, um, if there are people who are watching right now, trans people in particular, who are dealing with issues around HIV or COVID, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? Mm. Well, what I like to say to trans people whenever I talk to them is to remind us that we are lovable, that we're worthy of love, connection, and belonging. I like to remind folks that we are anointed, that in indigenous cultures all over the world, transgender people held sacred places, right? Sacred places. And I think it's important for us to know that history and to reclaim that, 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 that status. We are anointed. We are beautiful. Trans is beautiful. Laverne Cox, it's always a pleasure to hear from you, and, and I so appreciate your passionate advocacy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. The stigma for HIV continues to blow my mind on a daily basis. There's stigma in the workplace. It tears relationships apart. It tears families apart. Um, people living with HIV are at higher risk for violence and rape, especially in the trans community. And What's really shocking is that stigma runs really high in healthcare systems globally. And so as a result, people don't test because why would you wanna know that you have this? So when people don't test, they don't know their status and they continue to spread the virus. The only way to deal with this is through education. And that starts in the schools, you know, national campaigns, movies, commercials, you name it, make HIV a household word that isn't taboo and it will reduce stigma. Absolutely, such an important message. I wanna remind everyone that we are live and this is the road to a vaccine. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section and we will try to get to them uh, throughout the show. Our next segment is Vaccines 101, where we learn the basics about vaccine development uh, from leading scientists. Now, there are over a dozen vaccines going into human clinical trials, and J&J &J will be doing uh, much of that this month. For a better understanding of how clinical trials work, we have Makaya Dooji, uh, Head of Clinical Development and Medical Affairs at Janssen Vaccines. Makaya, thank you again for joining us. We haven't seen you uh, in a little while as well, so can you give us uh, a recent update on the status of J&J's COVID clinical trials. Uh, I know J&J recently announced you'll be beginning clinical trials at the end of this month, at the end of July, which is a month sooner than originally anticipated. So what did the data tell you that enabled you to move forward at this pace? Hi, Lisa, and thanks for having me back. It's good to be back, and we've been very busy. So it is indeed true that we've been able to successfully move forward the start of our clinical trial. Um, and it wasn't actually specific data that we, we had that, that made us go faster. Um, both our discovery and manufacturing teams have, you know, a process and manufacturing that they go through, and uh, most of the steps are sequential. And what they manage to do is at risk do some of those sequential steps in parallel without compromising the integrity of the vaccine. And that's really what enabled us to move that timeline up so substantially. So it's fantastic news because, yes, in a couple of weeks we will – be vaccinating the first participant, we hope, if all goes well. And um, yeah, every day that we can accelerate, I think could have tremendous impact. What does it take to launch a clinical trial for new vaccine development? Um, how are you going to set up the COVID-19 trials and, and where are they going to happen? Well, the answer depends on which study, but of course, for every trial that you have, you need to have a study protocol. 
So the study protocol outlines all the details of how you carry out the study that you have in mind. And so one of the key things is what are the main objectives? And so for your first clinical trials, the objective is always safety. And then you are also looking at how does how does the person respond um, immunologically to the vaccine? Do they generate certain types of immune responses? So we look for that. We might look at that and compare different dose levels. Um, and later on, then you start to look at efficacy. You continue to look at safety in every trial that you have, but uh, the objectives change depending on what type of trial you're talking about. So another component is who's eligible for the study. So we're starting with adults. Later in the development plan, we may end up expanding into pediatric populations. We're going to evaluate the elderly. Um, and so those are just some examples of different populations you might study over time. Um, how the study is carried out, so what are the schedule of activities, so what days do people have to come in for screening and vaccination, safety follow-up, um, and getting blood sampling to look at the immune responses, all of that's detailed in the schedule. So it really is a, a guide to how a study site investigator would carry out uh, the specific protocol. And then at the end, there's a discussion about how do you analyze the results and summarize them, because then, of course, we have to report that out and send a report into the regulators. So those are the nuts and bolts of a, a, the clinical trial. Now, in terms of our first in human study, we're planning to conduct that um, that study in the U.S. and also in Belgium, um, and these are sites we've worked with previously. Now, site selection is also important for every trial that you do. So we typically work with commercial um, or clinical research organizations. So those are professional clinical research sites. They're freestanding typically, and then also we can work with uh, universities. And we look for groups that have experience doing vaccine studies. They're a bit different than patient studies in terms of the types of evaluations you do, and also the intensity is a bit lighter. Um, and, and then we also um, have to figure out where are we going to go. Now, that becomes more critical, as Paul alluded to earlier when we talk about phase three. Um, where those sites are. So for phase three, we're actually taking a broader approach than a couple of countries. So U.S., of course, will be one country that we select, but we're also looking at several others, and we haven't finalized our site selection yet, but that, that's going to be happening in the coming months. So that's the process that you refer to as vaccine, I mean, a virus chasing, right? And I understand that you have to actually go to places where um, there is a, a, a high level of virus prominent. Is that true? Yes, indeed. And, and I think it's difficult in the COVID pandemic situation simply because we rely on epidemiology normally to figure out what size trial do we need and what kinds of assumptions we can make to be able to demonstrate efficacy. And I think one of the challenges is we don't know months from now um, what the situation is going to look like. And so how do we get a how do we tackle that? We're working with um, experts around the world, epidemiologists, um, modelers to really look at predicting months out where where is where are the hotspots going to be, where's the highest burden of cases. Um, and and we'll be able to do that with reasonable accuracy a few weeks um, out before we start the clinical trial. So the predictions we have now for let's say October, um, may change over time. And so we're going to monitor that, but that's what we're doing to try to reduce the uncertainty. But this is of critical importance, again, going back to the epidemiology. We look at incidence rates, so the number of new infections over a period of time, let's say it's over a year's period of time. Um, the size of your trial depends on that because you have to vaccinate these people, and those people that you vaccinate have to have a risk of getting the disease at some point, or you won't be able to measure anything. And so that's what we mean when we say we're chasing the virus because we have to go where those cases are going to be. If there's no chance of that, you either or a low chance, you'll either have a huge trial with lots of people, and that's very expensive and not exactly optimal, um, or you have a smaller number and you get your answer much quicker. And we would like to accelerate as much as possible because once we have the efficacy signal, then we really can move forward towards um, getting licensure for the vaccine so that people can access it. So really hitting those high burden areas is going to be critical for the speed and success of the program. Well, given how much the virus is spiking, there probably aren't, uh, you know, won't be many shortages of locations uh, around the world. Now, uh, during the AIDS crisis, J&J &J was the first company to have clinical trials in the transgender community. We were talking to both Laverne and Dr. Stoffels about this. Why do you believe it's critical to have diverse representation in clinical trials? And how do you plan to reach all communities once a COVID vaccine becomes available? 
Well, to answer that question first, I think the HIV experience and, and what we have been doing in the context of our HIV vaccine program is quite relevant for COVID. So um, there are certain communities and groups of people, um, African Americans are, are one, Latinos as well, um, who've been excluded from research over, you know, in the past. And there are a lot of efforts to improve that. And in the context of HIV, I mean, people who are most at risk should be able to access and, and participate in these clinical trials. So there's a huge amount of community engagement and established relationships that I think we can actually leverage to raise awareness on COVID in general, which is, I think is really important. And also, what are we doing in clinical trials? So if people are actually interested in participating, they have the opportunity to do so. But there's also scientific relevance um, to having a study that's, that's very diverse, and, and particularly with respect to COVID, because Black and brown people are disproportionately affected by COVID at higher risk. And so um, we can look at the impact on outcomes in, in some of those high risk groups. Um, but it's also about generalizability. So how representative are the, are the data coming out of that study? Um, and does it apply to the entire population? Because for vaccines, it's usually you try to cover as many people as possible. So without that information, you might not fully understand the, the differences that you might see with the vaccine in certain populations. We know, for example, that the elderly may have lower immune responses than younger adults or even children. And then um, there are gender differences. Women seem to respond better to vaccines than, than men do. And there could be some differences in, in other communities in terms of the impact there. So if you don't understand that, you're not necessarily going to be able to design the most optimal uh, vaccine for the population. So it's really critical that, that you, you look at that from the outset. Okay, we have a question from LinkedIn. A gentleman is asking whether you take into account genetic history uh, in the trials? Um, we would consider that maybe ex in an exploratory way if we saw some major differences in immune responses between um, different groups. Um, but we don't do that at the outset. So if we, we saw something that um, we didn't quite understand, then we could potentially pursue that. Um, Sharvani from LinkedIn also asked, do you think quality is compromised? I'm sorry, I just lost the question. I just lost the question. I'm sorry, I didn't come through all the way. Um, uh, do you think quality is compromised as vaccine developers uh, are moving so fast? I mean, this vaccine is being developed on an unprecedented timeline. Do you think uh, as a result, quality could be compromised? No, I, not, not from a safety perspective, definitely not. Um, I think one of the reasons we've been able to move faster, and certainly we're not the first, we were not the first into the clinic, but with from our platform data. So we use a, a, a viral vector to um, introduce the, the genetic material that um, produces the immune response to, to the COVID virus. So it's, a, it's sort of a vehicle for delivery. Now we use that for a number of different vaccines, including our HIV vaccine, our RSV vaccine, Ebola, which just recently was approved in, in Europe. Um, so um, we have a huge amount of safety data. So over 67,000 people have been vaccinated with that platform, and we do see very comparable safety. So that gives us and the regulators confidence that um, there, there's a good track record in terms of safety. But in, once you get into the clinical trials, there's nothing that's cut in terms of corners. We might say uh, we know which dose levels to evaluate because of our platform experience and narrow four doses down to two, for example, because we just have the prior experience and know what kinds of immune responses are likely to be the most effective. And, um, but the safety is always standard. So you look at short-term safety and long-term safety and those rules have not changed. So um, we, we are moving faster and, and sometimes spending more money allows you to do your trials quicker. And so we're using sort of those ways to move things faster without compromising on any of the safety aspects. Uh, we also have another question from LinkedIn. A gentleman is asking, uh, to what extent are you still working hard on the, the HIV AIDS vaccine, or are you directing all resources to a COVID vaccine? That's a very good question. And, um, you know, now that I, the AIDS 2020 conference has started, we'll be talking about this some more. An HIV vaccine is still a priority. We have prioritized coronavirus um, research as well. Um, but we're really trying to take advantage of the lessons that we're learning um, from social isolation, doing virtual visits to restart 
um, a lot of our activities. So there, of course, are delays actually to all of our clinical programs because of COVID, but we have not, um, well, we have ongoing studies, so there is an imperative to keep things moving, and we're looking at safe ways to restart in, in um, the various geographic regions where our studies are, are moving um, forward in um, slowly, and we take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's a delay, um, but hopefully we'll be going ahead full speed. And I think the challenge in some countries that are doing both COVID vaccine trials and HIV vaccine trials is getting that balance of um, how to prioritize exactly. But um, hopefully with increasing staffing, um, we can manage that safely. Micaiah, uh, I have another question. People are so anxious to know about the progress of, of the COVID vaccine. By the way, that previous question was asked by Mason, and he uh, is attending the AIDS 2020 conference. And this new question is from Lucas from LinkedIn, who asks, at what stage of clinical trials, phase one, two, or three, will the decision be taken to produce the doses, knowing J&J's plans to scale up and produce prior to FDA approval to meet demands? Also a very good question. We're actually doing that now. So this is already work that's underway and we didn't wanna wait for any data. So we're not even in the clinic and we've already started scaling up um, on the supply chain side. So that's, that's for the commercial material. And so that way, if we have an efficacy signal the moment that we do, we will have the vaccine supply um, that, that we've promised um, available for use. Makaya Daogi, thank you so much for taking the time. Always such an informative uh, discussion and I look forward to talking to you as well over the coming weeks to hear about the progress you're making. Thank you so much, Makaya. Thank you. Now there are I over 37 million- The biggest million lessons that HIV and the entire HIV pandemic can teach us about COVID is that we can get through this. We can get through this together. And gosh, this sounds really cheesy, but we have to love each other. We have to love each other and take care of each other. And that's how we get through this, like we've gotten through everything else. We have to love each other. There are over 37 million people living globally with HIV. And thanks to the availability of antiretroviral therapy or ART, people with HIV are able to live long and healthy lives. Our next guest is Tico Kerr. He's a Canadian visual artist and long-term survivor whose battle with HIV found uh, its way into his heart-stoppingly beautiful paintings. Tico Kerr, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Lovely to meet you. Well, I understand you've been living with HIV for 35 plus years. As someone uh, who has been dealing with it for a very long time, what is it like now and, and how has it changed over time? The improvement in my quality of life over the last 35 years is uh, insurmountable. Uh, in the beginning, there was so little hope. There were no therapies available. Uh, there was a, a lot of stigma and fear People were dying in shame and loneliness. Uh, but over the course of 35 years with community activists coming together with medical professionals, um, a better understanding of the disease has come about where now we've developed new drugs that are incredibly effective. And I've found uh, a totally normal um, way to live out the rest of my life. Uh, it's a, HIV is no longer a death sentence, it's uh, considered a mere chronic um, disease to be dealt with with regular drugs. Tico, I, I have friends who've been living with HIV for a long time now too. And in the early days, they were taking massive amounts of pills every single day. Um, yeah. Did you also have to do that? And, and what is your treatment uh, protocol like now? Yes, in the beginning um, when things weren't that clear, um, people were getting thrown all kinds of drugs at them. And for me in particular, I was well enough along in my infection where um, I would barely hang on long enough until a new drug would be developed and so I'd uh, jump on that one. So it was a long series of uh, different kinds of drugs, 30 or 40 or 50 over the years, up to a point where I was probably taking about 80 to about 120 pills a day. Now with the new meds, uh, it's vastly improved. I take uh, maybe five to 10 every day, and it's a uh, completely normal lifestyle that I have. 120 
pills a day. That is <laughs> astounding. How did you manage to find a treatment that has been working for you? Well, I, I've been really lucky in that my personal physician here in Vancouver is Dr. Julio Montana of the BC Center of Excellence, who is one of the heavy hitters in the international AIDS community. Um, with him um, under my wing, he actually pressed me to educate myself. And in 2005, when all medications stopped working for me and I started to flatline, they really started dumping a lot of meds on me. And Julio and myself uh, led a, a really public um, outcry against Health Canada, which is our equivalent of the FDA, for compassionate access to two new drugs that looked really promising in clinical trials overseas. Um, the drugs were being developed by Dr. Paul Stoffels, our old friend, and um, we, we were given the drugs after a 10-month fight with Health Canada. And within five days, the amount of virus in my system dropped by 90%. So now, happily, those drugs have been licensed, and uh, they're very much uh, available to people that are most in need of it uh, in my country and around the world. That's so incredible. Um, Tico, we have two of your paintings that I would like to share with the people who are watching. One is called A Knife Called Defiance, and another is called Meditations on Compassion. Starting with A Knife Called Defiance, can you talk about the story behind both of these paintings and the emotion that went into them? Well, when I was at my worst, I decided to keep a record of my experience in case I was to die of AIDS, I wanted to leave a record of, of what I was going to be living through. So I started to do a series of self-portraits that are all on the medical paraphernalia that are a, a byproduct of my therapies. So they're pill bottles and um, uh, injections with um, vials and syringes and that sort of thing. In this one particular painting, as you could probably see, I'm, I'm looking pretty angry. <laughs> and it was that anger actually that I credit um, my survival through those dark days. So um, my anger propelled me through my fight with Health Canada. And I think it was very responsible for me uh, becoming the survivor um, in no uncertain terms that I am today. Um, meditations on about... Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Meditations on That's compassion. Okay. Um, that's a hospital painting that I executed uh, after spending another long uh, period of time in St. Paul's Hospital here in Vancouver, which has uh, saved my life many times. Uh, at my very worst, when I was painting this painting, um, it was when I was at the height of my fight for the meds with Health Canada. And the working title for this painting was, My Government is Trying to Kill Me. Um, and then as I was completing the, the canvas, um, we were given the drugs. My health came back, and with a, with a cooler brow, I decided to change the title to Meditations on Compassion. Well, they are uh, extraordinary pieces. Uh, Tico, as we all know, we are now in the midst of another pandemic, COVID-19. Um, what's it like for you to live through this now? And, and do you see parallels between COVID and HIV? It's, it's very much uh, a case of deja vu, of, of course, again. Um, the same kind of fears, um, stigmas, blames, blaming um, that I experienced with HIV is, is still pretty much relevant today. Similarities are it's the same kind of um, case where it's a novel virus unknown to humanity before now. Um, that it actually uh, jumped from the animal kingdom to the human uh, kingdom, uh, as many viruses do. At the same time, there's also been a very um, re strong reluctance by the international community to have taken the pandemics seriously in the beginning. And I think we're paying the price for that uh, right now. So, um, and again, also that uh, it's disproportionately in both cases, COVID and HIV disproportionately um, focused on people of color and minorities. Um, Shivani from LinkedIn is asking, 
how you manage uh, your day given doctor visits and, and, and medications and so on? I have a pretty much a normal life now. Uh, I, I do pretty much any, anything that uh, normal people do. I have rare uh, doctor's visits. I do blood work once every three months, but I just maintain taking pills in the morning and in the evening every 12 hours, and that's my lifestyle. It's very manageable. We have Kudzani, uh, who is at the AIDS 2020 conference, and he's asking um, how you've been able to maintain your strength through this fight. Well, I, I have a terrific support group. Um, the people in my life that I love and cherish me um, have been in, invaluable to me. Um, and, I, and I keep active. I try to keep positive. I'm a half glass full kind of guy. Uh, I'm hopeful for the future. And having an outlet, a creative outlet, as I do with my work, is um, has been a godsend. It, it keeps me really grounded and um, working hard to take the next step forward. Tico Kerr, thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing your, your wisdom, your experience, and your beautiful art with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. That was Tico Kerr, an extremely talented and compassionate long-term HIV survivor. This is the Road to a Vaccine, live from the AIDS 2020 conference. And while we still have no vaccine for HIV, I have just been so struck by the dedication and passion in the scientists we've met on their mission to beat this deadly disease. And I'm even more blown away by the human stories, the people of all races, ages, and genders who live with this disease every day. They are survivors in every sense of the word. Now, next week, we'll be back with the most up-to-date information on the COVID pandemic. I, I can tell you, you won't want to miss that. But we're going to leave you now with some inspiring words from advocates from the front lines of the continued fight against HIV, set to the beautiful and powerful song, Surviving Still, written by fellow HIV activist and artist, Jesus Herberto Guillén. We'll see you next week. No excuses, nobody's fault. For he felt like the end of the world It was a moment that changed my life Soft as a rose, sharp as a knife And time flew by